Hi, I'm Brian Usena, and I'm the um, director of Beyond Reanimator, um, the second sequel to uh, Stuart Gordon's classic Reanimator, made in 1984. We hear the the refrain of the Reanimator music from that first movie, which was written and and conducted by no Richard miedo, Band. Miedo? This, um, this sequence, this prologue, it's a bit different from the previous two. Uh, it's kind of more of a slasher movie prologue, uh, trying to pick up where the, um, where the last movie, Bride of Reanimator, left off. In this case, um, we were trying to... Um, kind of introduce the movie almost from another genre, from, from a, um, a genre that maybe is a little more familiar to the younger audience that um, probably believes that horror movies began with Scream. So this um, sequence was um, meant to, to kind of evoke that type of atmosphere and that type of storytelling. That's um, Joshua Gaeta, who is the... Boy with the Glasses. Um, the movie was shot in um, Barcelona and Valencia, Spain, and he is a um, resident of Spain. All these boys are, all the actors are, except for Jeffrey Combs and um, Jason Barry. We had to uh, look pretty far to find uh, this type of a kind of North American style house in um, near Barcelona. Uh, this actress, Barbara Elorieta, is um, is the daughter of a um, of a Spanish director. And of course, the this scene is kind of a setup for the kind of humor that um, we felt was was um, essential to to what we'd consider a reanimator movie. Howie, eres tú. Howie, basta de juegos, ¿me oyes? It's kind of your typical sort of Halloween, Friday the 13th type of um, sequence. Howie? And it um, is supposed to set you up for a, a um, kind of maniac on the loose type of picture. Has olvidado cerrarla. No, tú has sido el último en... Originally, the, um, when we first began talking about a, another reanimator, it was right after we finished Bride. And of course, Jeffrey Combs was a part of that conversation. And early on, um, of the writer of um, Return of the Living Dead 3, John Penny, um, was kind of a sounding board for us and um, was very helpful. <laughs> Dios mío, ¿pero qué hacéis fisgando? No hacíamos nada. Ah, oh, ¿cómo que no? No le suelo. And of course, once we do the the cheat stinger, we go right into a zombie movie. And these, this um, zombie, we call it the prologue zombie, was created by Pedro de Diego, a young um, um, effects artist from Madrid. And uh, he had never really had a... A, a gag of his own in a movie before. He had worked for other companies, but he showed me some designs he had for it, and, and I thought they looked terrific. And uh, although the the original concept for this um, began with uh, a someone who worked as a conceptual artist, uh, Richard Raphorst of, of the Netherlands, someone who collaborates with us on a lot of the Fantastic Factory movies. And we were trying to find a, a kind of a, a 
sort of a zombie gag. And the gag, of course, is, is that we think the zombie wants to kill her, but she's just in the way of the milk. And so showing this was, you know, you get the feeling that this isn't your average slasher movie. This is pretty fantastical. This is a zombie. But it's the kind of gooey, fun zombie that is it's sort of more of an 80s style EC Comics type of zombie. And of course, with Reanimator, you've got to have a, you've got to have some serious gore in it. Uh, although I think today, you, the the gore has to be a little cleaner than was acceptable back in the 80s. Emily, vuelve, Emily, Emily, Emily. So uh, what's different about this movie than the last two is in the prologue it's we've been going for quite a few minutes here and we haven't seen our hero or our anti-hero uh, Herbert West Jeffrey Combs and of course we'll eventually get there this is a gag that is sort of more of a reanimator 2 type gag and also just shows that wow these things even their even body parts can have life and now of course we finally see Jeffrey although that was a um, a stand-in that he th that went into the car. Here's Jeffrey Combs. We did think about trying to make him look younger, and um, we just decided to give him his old glasses, and and let him take care of the acting. And I think he, um, you know, this is supposed to be back in 19, I guess 90. The title sequence is also um, created and, um, and um, executed, produced by Richard Raphorst um, and um, David De Winter of, the Amster of Amsterdam. And it was, um, of course, meant to evoke the first reanimator, the second reanimator, but Richard wanted to go in a less, um, in a less colorful way and, and with a lot more detail. Of course, they. They they um, hidden they have hidden in within there all kinds of names and oddball things within the graphics of it which I haven't even been able to find a lot of them but you'll see a lot of times you'll find names in there that have nothing to do with the um, kind of Grey's Anatomy type of type of pic pictures I think this is a marvelous. Uh, uh, credit sequence. It was when I first saw it. I said, "Man, this this credit sequence better than the movie." Uh, but it's it's really really brilliant. And the fu there's a funny story when when um, Richard sent me the DVD of the credit sequence. Um, he also mentioned, "Oh, by the way, I included the music." Um, a friend of mine gave me some music to put on it. Of course, I didn't even give that a second thought. But when we heard the music. Uh, we actually ended up using it. We transcribed it and orchestrated it, and um, that music is actually by Ren Owenhand, another another Dutchman. Um, and I think it's a really interesting variation on the Bernard Herrmann-esque Reanimator theme that um, that Richard um, Band created for the first and second movies. Writers are Miguel Tejada Flores and Jose Manuel Gomez. Jose Manuel is from, is a Catalan, he's from Barcelona. And Miguel Tejada Flores is actually an American, lives up in, um, in Talent, Oregon. Uh, he's uh, probably most known for his, um, for his contributions as a writer to Revenge of the Nerds. I really like the um, the way the movie opens with the rat because I think it it draws your attention immediately. Uh, it was really really hell trying to make this rat do anything. Cesar Nebrera is a also a um, everybody is a, a local guy from Barcelona, and he was kind of the rat trainer. Well, I think as far as the training went, the rat didn't bite. But it was just um, so difficult to get it to do anything. Everything is just a, you know, a, um, a um, triumph of, of, you know, slowing down the picture, freeze frames, um, careful cutting. 
the idea of um, of West working in the prison and continuing his experiments um, came about pretty early in the process. We went through all of the 90s when it was when I just couldn't get the um, the picture to be um, financed. There really wasn't much interest during the 90s for a reanimator. Then somehow in the early 2000s, um, I don't know if it was the advent of DVD or what, but they, but all of a sudden there was this great interest in, in, in um, reviving all these um, old um, kind of classic horror movies. The idea of the of the of us being in prison was um, was something that that came up pretty early in the process. I really felt like, gosh, I, this guy is going to have to be they, they're going to have to throw him in jail after all of this stuff. And I like the idea that he continued his his work is in prison. It also helped that since it took so long to get this um, picture going, uh, thirteen years, uh, I really worried also about how the um, about what West would have done if he was out of prison. I, I just thought, gosh, that so much would have happened that I don't know how we could pick it up. So I thought, well, by putting him on ice, it would slow down his experiments. But we called it Beyond Reanimator because I wanted to get past the um, just reanimation and reanimating body parts. And of course, in Bride, we even put them together to make a, 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 a woman. Um, doodling with body parts, we and also we'd almost pretty much used up all the um, all the elements of the six stories that H.P. Lovecraft wrote about Herbert West. So um, on this picture, uh, we purposefully didn't um, include H.P. Lovecraft's name because I thought that was um, really not very fair and um, and it's kind of misleading. This is a this is a whole different, uh, what we have is Herbert West, and Herbert West is more or less the character that was created by, by Stuart Gordon and Dennis Paoli and William Norris for the very first movie. And of course, um, interpreted brilliantly by Jeffrey Combs. This prison is a prison in Valencia, um, Spain, and um, I was pretty surprised when we were able to get put up get so many extras and even clean this place, which was abandoned, and it was so disgustingly dirty, I just never thought we could ever shoot there. And it really surprised me when Jorenz Miquel, our, our production designer, who I think is brilliant, um, um, was able to turn this thing into something that looked like an American prison. Um, for example, in Spanish prisons, they don't have bars on the doors. Everything's shut up. But in an American prison, we're used to seeing bars on the prison cells. So we had to add those bars. Um, this centerpiece with the, um, where the guards had their control, that was also um, added. So almost all the little cabinets and, and behind us, the, um, the guards letting in Jason Barry, who plays our hero, Howard Phillips. Um, um, all of that was added by Jorenz Miquel. Uh, now, of course, this is a set. This we were. This we shot in um, in Barcelona, and I think it, it probably is, is fairly apparent that the death house is a is is kind of designy. Uh, I'm not. I doubt that there's any prisons where they have bars on the ceilings and bars on both sides, but it's a lot more cinematic. It it gives us a little more <coughs> more depth. To, to look at. Jason Berry um, basically um, takes the place of Bruce Abbott in this movie. Bruce Abbott, of course, played um, Dan Cain, the, the um, protagonist of the first two films. Um, because originally Dan, uh, Bruce Abbott was, was, there was no question in my mind that he would reprise his role for the third one. The problem was that once we got to, um, got s so many years down the line, I was a little concerned that it was gonna be a story about two middle-aged doctors instead of two young doctors. Uh, of course, we couldn't, we couldn't um, give up West because he is the movie, but I felt like we really had to add a whole new, um, kind of romance and, and kind of straight story for him to, um, 
to work off of. Um, this is Elsa Pataki, uh, a very famous in Spain kind of cover girl model, um, young actress, yeah, but mostly like romantic comedies, etc. She's just the just a great uh, a, a great person, beautiful, and um, really surprised a lot of people and had a lot of fun doing it with this. Um, pretty amazing role that she has in this picture. Simone Andreo is the warden, and of course, uh, if you're a reanimator fan, you realize that he's kind of standing in for the, the late David Gale, who played Dr. Hill in the first two movies, or the Dr. Hill in the first movie, and Dr. Hill's head in the second movie. Um, uh, Simon Andreo is a real pro. He's just been in everything. He's in any big American movie that comes to Spain, and he's very well known in Spain. He's probably been in about 120 films. Uh, we did change his look. He he has a. We gave him new hair. We gave him a mustache. We completely. Uh, we tried to give him a, a different look than he usually has to give him a more severe kind of look. And uh, I think he's a real pro. And further on in the movie, you'll see what he has to, what he has to um, go through. And you realize it's the kind of part that, boy, you really have to have a lot of confidence to do. Um, here we have Nico Basha, who is a, um, who's an incredible, <laughs> incredible artist. Um, he plays Moses, and um, he is a, he is a. Um, an actor who I actually met um, by watching a one-man show of his uh, in which only his hands acted. He, he had a, I went to see a one-man show and he had a little black stage with a curtain and everything and he came up made up kind of like Nosferatu and, um, and used just his hands all made up and with different costumes to tell a story without dialogue and it's amazing. He entertained you for 80 minutes. Um, he's a young guy but he has such an incredible look. The part originally was supposed to be for a very old man. And after seeing him, I just I just couldn't stick with the old man concept. I had to go with, I had to use him. He, he's, um, he's an actor that um, I kind of feel he sometimes does, puts more energy into playing dead than most actors put into a fight scene. Um, the guy holding the bag is a tremendous talent, Santiago Segura, um, responsible for the Torrente series in Spain, uh, probably the third most, um, um, most um, profitable um, movie in Spanish history. He's, a, he's, he's really funny, and, and it was really great to have him. From the very beginning, when I, when I realized I was going to be doing a reanimator in Spain, which is, of course, where I live and, and, and oversee the um, Fantastic Factory line of films, I, um, I just knew Santiago Segura had to be in it. This is Raquel Gibler. She's also, she's from Madrid, another Spanish actress. Of course, we had to do our casting, always looking for actors that could speak English, which is pretty tough, pretty tough in Spain, not only to find people who could speak English, but work on the accent and, and also act in English. Jason Berry, though, is, of course, Irish. This is, um, when we began the movie, I felt like we really had to get into some reanimator type scenes quite early. And so we, we go right into um, kind of a hospital type scene, which, um, which is, um, you know, pretty much what the first two movies were, were uh, centered around. It was um, pretty interesting when I decided that we would have, that we should play the whole movie as a prison movie. Um, that wasn't the original concept when, when I would um, discuss it with um, Jeffrey Combs and um, certainly um, John Penny and Miguel Tejada Flores, and we were going round and round on this. Originally, the um, prison was just um, where we find West doing his experiments on rats. But once I got into it and started looking at the options I, and also the problems of shooting in Spain, um, as, um, as America, I thought, well, you know, making it a prison movie isn't bad. It kind of gives it this whole kind of um, atmosphere and, and puts it in kind of a box that, that uh, a, a kind of another subgenre. I watched a lot of 
prison movies to, to see how it worked, how they work. And the ones I have to admit that I liked the best were, were um, Escape from Alcatraz and Penitentiary, which I think is just really wild. But Escape from Alcatraz had all the like really classic angles and, and prison um, lang the sort of cinematic language of prisons. Uh, it was really important to me to get this serum out right as early as I could in the movie. Um, it was, unfortunately, it was, uh, and we've been able to correct it for the DVD, but in the theatrical print, the serum turned out to be kind of yellow. I thought that it should look like it was a bit degraded. This is the big moment, and I think Jeffrey just does it great. Jeffrey comes back to be Herbert West, and the, the intensity of this to me is, is just wonderful. And of course, his acting style is what, is what um, really sets the tone for the whole movie. You can just about see what, you know, you can see his thoughts. And of course, for fans of Reanimator, we know what he's thinking, and we are delighted to see it. And of course, this is a fairly, I worried a lot about this scene because it seems so contrived that we're just killing somebody so that we could have them there, so we could have the serum and get them to reanimate right away. But I think when it all, when it all was done, I don't get that contrived feeling. It seems like it, it flows pretty well. But we really wanted to have a kind of a, a kind of a traditional reanimator scene just as soon as we could uh, during the first act, and and this is of course it. As soon as um, Jeffrey Combs came on the set, uh, the whole movie started turning into reanimator. We had it all set up. We were we had shot I think a few days or more, or maybe a week before he arrived, and but boy, the minute the first scene he did, it just set the tone. And all the other actors, um, um, I think, got a, got a lot of, um, you know, understood the tone based on Jeffrey's um, way of, of, of acting. Piénselo mejor, vamos. Podemos hacer más. Aquí? Ni siquiera tiene lo básico para primeros auxilios como has podido comprobar. Pero ahora es of course, this, this scene is, um, is almost, uh, it's, it has the same kind of um, beats of, the, of, a, of, a, of a scene that you might have seen in the first film. It's not as, I don't think it's as violent or as gruesome as the first movie, and I have to admit, I kind of would have liked to have seen the movie a bit more extreme in the gore department, but I was very aware while we were making it that um, we had to be, um, we, we, I really tried to keep in mind a little bit broader audience for it. I think Raquel Gibler really does a great job of reacting. She always, um, she always, kind of keeps me interested. The, um, the scene ends with a kind of a gag, or it doesn't end, but the, but the resolution here is kind of a gag, and you know, we're a little heavy-handed, or I hope not heavy-handed, but we're certainly a, a um, you know, an intention to give it kind of an irony, the movie. To give it that sense of um, fun that I think um, the first one did so well. And this was a, this was a, this was a very um, difficult scene to mount because we had just so many of the actors all in the same room, and that's always kind of tricky to get everybody working at the same time. Fortunately, um, my first AD, Fernando Izquierdo, who is, um, also has worked on a number of the, of the Fantastic Factory films, is just one of the best, I think, in the world. And he, he really was able to, to keep keep things going and, and is, was always very helpful with, with the staging, uh, of, of these kinds of more complex scenes. Doctor Phillips, one of my men is dead. I'll take care of him. 
Sargento, encierro general inmediatamente. Um, I should mention um, in this movie um, our editor. Um, the um, I think there's a real. Uh, I think it's one of the strongest. Um, one of the strongest um, elements in the picture, and it's Bernat Villaplana, and it was his, he's a young guy, it was his first feature. And he, I was, I didn't, of course, didn't know his work, because he, he really, he didn't have any um, feature work, but he was just, I think he really did a terrific job of keeping the pace going in the movie and um, intercutting down the road where, where we really needed to, um, keep a rhythm going. And I think when all is said and done, um, you have to give a lot of credit uh, to Bernat um, for, for, for um, any of the success the film has in its, uh, its pacing and its storytelling. The music is by, um, by Xavi Capellas. Although you can hear the phrases from um, the original Reanimator theme by Richard Band, um, it, I was really wanted the the fans to get a feeling to have the reference for the first one, but I, I really felt like we had to do something different this time. Here we got um, Valencia, Spain, and there's the. Uh, the prison. Of course, we cleaned it up a little digitally in that last shot and added some lights in the windows and, you know, the, the yard was in pretty bad shape and the roof, but um, uh, FilmTel, which is a digital house in Barcelona, I thought did a very good job of, of, of the digital effects that we have in the movie and keeping them quite, um, uh, quite integrated into the picture to, to where you really don't, um, you don't notice them as being effects. We shot most of the picture in, in Barcelona, but we were in Valencia for about two weeks shooting all the, the location prison stuff. Un día ajetreado, eh, Moses? Te desembarazaste de cuatro hombres mientras sufrías el infarto. ¿Cómo lo hiciste? ¿Te dieron alguna medicación? The director of photography is Andreu Reves, and um, I thought, I thought he did a pretty good job of, of kind of um, giving us the sort of the genre look, but also kind of gi giving, uh, I think the, the darks and the darks are really nice in the picture and it has sort of an atmospheric look. Um, not, it's cartoony, but, but not, but with kind of a lot of subtlety. This is Kike Arce. And in fact, his character Cabrera was a um, was originally meant to be this big dumb guy. Um, I don't think he's really smart. I, I mean, the character didn't get to be a, a brain, but he. Um, but I thought, but Kike was really the best actor um, we could find. Uh, we did have a problem with the prison because we all our extras are from Valencia, so this must be the only um, prison in in the United States that has almost no black people. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of Hispanic types in Spain, so, of course, we leaned heavily on that. Oh, por favor. No te rindas. Todo es posible. Solo hay, hay que estudiar las Xavi Capellas also was the, was the um, composer for the first Fantastic Factory film, Faust, and uh, I think he, he really has a great feel for mu movie music. He's a real student of it. And he, and with the limited resources we had, he was able to orchestrate uh, most of the score and, um, and took it down to a symphonic orchestra in Valencia for, for recording. There was a, it was, it was a very tricky problem in this movie to try to retell the story of Reanimator, to retell the story of Herbert West, who he was, what he did, and do it in such a way that, that someone who had never seen the first few movies, which would be probably most of the viewers, wouldn't be at any disadvantage. The movie itself would tell you enough about West's background so you would get it, um, and that's the, the reason for showing the serum up front, for showing a reanimated corpse up front, for in the prologue showing something fairly extreme, which is the, which is the tone of reanimator, and, and then trying to give us a new story. 
And further on, of course, we'll find out why, why West is experimenting on rats and what exactly this is all about. But in the first act, um, it was really more a problem of trying to, trying to give us a feeling for who West was and then really set up the um, Howard Phillips um, story and, 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 of course, the, the, um, the necessary love story. I felt like the, the, the girl, the blonde, the young girl who's typically the victim in a horror movie, um, had to kind of respect the, the times that we live in and what the audience expects from, a, from, a, from, the, from the girl in the movie, the girlfriend, is a bit different than it was when um, we made the first Reanimator in 1984. Um, that, the blonde in that movie was the great Barbara Crampton. And um, for those that have seen it, you'll remember that that she was really a victim. She was the daughter of the dean, and she was the girlfriend of the guy, of the young man, and she was really existed to be lusted after by the bad guy, and become a victim that had to be saved by the heroes. And this is kind of really, generally, was the the pattern for for I think um, female leads in movies. Um, up until, I guess, Alien, when Signore Weaver ended up being kind of the, the action hero of the movie. The, the, with, with, um, with this picture, though, I really felt like the, the audience today really wasn't going to accept, especially the female audience, and I think the male audience too, isn't going to accept a, just a, the female lead as a, as a victim to be, to be saved by the hero. So in this case, I tried to make her still the beautiful blonde, but also give her a little more aggression and, and have her creating a lot of the story. So even though Howard Phillips creates the story by, by going to the prison, getting a job there so that he can, so that with carrying that, that serum for 13 years, um, so that he can work with West, I, I felt like that's a, that, that the girl also had to drive the fo story forward, which she will by being a, an investigative reporter and an ambitious, um, uh, ambitious young lady. In this scene, we're kind of setting up the problem of the whole movie that makes it beyond reanimator. In the previous movies, of course, the problem was reanimating the dead, bringing the dead back to life, defeating death, creating new life in the second one. In this one, uh, we see that Howard um, sets up the problem by saying, gosh, what's the deal? We bring this guy back to life, but he's kind of like, a, he's, he's loony. He's, he acts really weird. He's sort of like a monster. And Wes says, yeah, that's always been the problem, but um, I'm working on it. And so that becomes the, that becomes what, um, what really the movie is all about as far as Wes, um, Wes research go. He, I, I thought about it and I thought, well, what is it that, that, you know, what's the problem with zombies and reanimator, reanimation, reanimated um, corpses now? It's that they always seem to act so out of control, whether it's Dr. Hill or, or whether it's um, uh, Dean Halsey being reanimated or, or anybody else. They're always either, they're just like mindless zombies or they're really extreme distortions of a, of a human being. So here we, of course, of course, we were obliged to create the serum so we can have some zombies in this movie, and we needed to have this classic sort of the movie, you know, the the sequence and a kind of a more traditional reanimator sequence in which the serum is created. And then this is this is the montage sequence, which I think Bernat, by the way, did a great job on, in which we actually use a complete cue from the first movie, although we re-recorded it. But this is um, basically Richard Band music here, and, and this is, for the fans of the first movie, very, very familiar. And in this scene, of course, we, we began um, getting the idea of what Elsa Pataki's character is up to and um, what kind of... Um, complication she's going to um, create in um, Howard Phillips' life. No. Um, solo me preguntaba cómo está aquel hombre. Está bien. Está bien. 
Elsa Pataki, by the way, her is um, is not only famous in Spain <clears throat> for being a model and and uh, and a young actress, but she's also uh, the girlfriend of of one of the um, one of the the champion motorcycle racers in the world, Fonzi. And it's, uh, that also gives her sort of a, a cachet in Spain. She becomes, they're like a, a pretty um, glamorous couple. <laughs> and this was our, this is where we also tried to bring out the the um, backstory. What happened at the Miskatonic massacre? What happened in the last two movies? And of course, we even got a photo of, of West from those movies. This is okay, Santiago Segura, the the, the in, immensely talented um, Spanish actor. Um, he actually, um, in his previous movies, was uh, hugely overweight. He's lost a lot of weight here, and he's a big, big horror fan. Did a lot of I've seen all his short movies, and he's like he was he's a, really was a horror geek and just made some of the most uh, you know extreme horror and comedy that I've ever seen. And he's a real, uh, and he, of course he was really delighted to, to take part in a Reanimator movie of which he's quite, um, you know, he's of course quite familiar with not only Reanimator but all the genre. Nos vemos en el patio. Eres hombre muerto. Hombre muerto. Hoy es el día. Ha funcionado. Cancele mis visitas de esta tarde. Pero... Doctor. Most Reanimator fans will know that the, um, the green stuff is luminol. Um, and this was... Um, this is what Tony Dublin, the effects supervisor of the first movie, came up with for the serum. In the, of course, in the... Lovecraft stories, um, the serum didn't really have um, any special visual quality, but um, we thought that it should. We thought that it should have this magic aspect to it, and uh, of course the luminol is what you literally find in those glow sticks that um, you use at Halloween or at, um, at nightclubs. Uh, you, we basically would cut, cut them open and pour the two different um, liquids in separate jars and then mix them when we, when we needed them. And of, of course, when in the second movie, for example, we used so much of this stuff that we had to buy it in bulk. But in this movie, for example, we, it was unnecessary to, to do any more than, than buy the glow sticks. This set of the execution chamber, the electric chair room, is absolutely absurd, of course. And it was, uh, I, I really liked it. Uh, we, we, we looked at the, we certainly researched uh, execution chambers. And the problem is, is that they're all really boring looking. And, um, and along with Llorenz Baquel, um, we discussed um, having the movie have kind of a more naturalistic look on the surface and the prison and the yard and all that. And it looked like a prison movie. But as we go down into the death house, we start distorting the reality a little. And by the time we get down here, we're off in some kind of um, sort of, you know, it's the equivalent of the, it's almost like a, an old German expressionist um, movie set. So uh, it was, um, it was a something that I thought was necessary for the, to give the, the movie sort of a fantastical look. This, um, of course, is a, is a fake rat, although I remember when Jeffrey and Jason first came up to this set, they, they made sure that that wasn't a real dead rat. <laughs> I guess it's because Jeffrey remembers that in the, that in the first reanimate we used a real dead cat in the movie. Um, this is made by um, RH, RHK effects of, of Madrid, and it's Amador Rehak is the, um, 
is the artist in, in that company. He did both, uh, he did this effect, uh, all the puppet, puppet rat business is his. Um, I, of course, the fur on it doesn't exactly match the um, fur of the real rat, but since we, when it was a, a zombie, when it's a reanimated um, rat, I think it's fine for it to look different. It's supposed to look um, pretty stressed out and, and not natural. And, of course, that's the whole point of this, is to explain the concept of the nanoplasm, or NPE, which is um, my, um, my explanation for what the soul is. Um, it's what directs the cells to, to grow. So here, we, this was like a very carefully designed to try to explain um, what the nanoplasm is and how it works visually. So by seeing that the dead rat, the zombie rat, is, a, is, just, is this crazed, um, out-of-control zombie, we go through an animated sequence, once again by Filmtel of Barcelona, um, and um, it's kind of the Fantastic Voyage type of shot. And as we come out, now we're with the real rat. So you see the fur is all changed, um, of course, completely absurd that it would change like that, but I think visually it gets the point across. You get the idea that you bring something back to life, okay, it's reanimated, but you put that nanoplasm in them, and um, now it's got real life. This um, scene, um, of course, is, is also sort of obligatory in that West, it seems, in both previous movies, is always a bit kind of disgusted by Dan, by Dan, or in this case, Howard's um, attraction to the opposite sex. He's, um, he sees that it's just getting in the way of, of, um, of the work. This um, actor, Lolo Herrero, is, uh, is actually a Madrid fireman, also an actor. Many actors, of course, work dual jobs. I, I think um, David Gale, when he did Reanimator, was also had a job as a librarian, if I'm not mistaken. But this, I, I like Lolo. I think he really gives a great, he's a real likable sort of dimwit. And this is, of course, the uh, actual Valencia prison here. Not the interior of the cell, but certainly this, um, this solitary confinement wing. We shot, we shot most of these, I think all of the um, yard scenes in one day. <laughs> we got all, I think we had all our extras for, I think, two days or something. And we, of course, we just used them. We just shot everything that had extras. They were all from Valencia. And it was kind of interesting because we separated them into prisoners and guards as they came in. And, of course, there's many fewer guards than prisoners, and we gave them their costumes. And it was really interesting to see that the ones who were prisoners all stuck together and the guards stuck together. The prisoners all would just sat on the ground and waited for the shots, and the guards stood around. And they just immediately started, um, they started acting their, their costumes. This is, of course, the typical prison yard scene. We always have one, there's always one in a prison movie. Uh, of course, this is uh, there's um, <coughs> digital um, work on the on the rat. The rat didn't have any teeth sticking out like that, and it's that sort of babe type of um, digital animation added to the to the real rat. To, to um, get an idea of what went on in a prison and what you could write for a prison and what you couldn't, um, before, long before we ever had a script for this, um, Miguel Tejada Flores and I um, visited three prisons in Oregon and Washington. Uh, 
minimum security, a medium security, and a maximum security, and toured them. And especially the maximum security in Salem, Oregon, really, really impressed me because I never realized what what a city it is. It's a complete world unto itself. And I realized that, in fact, um, Wes probably wouldn't have had to, like, hidden in his cell to do his, his experiments because they, 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 a lot of these prisoners actually ran little businesses out of the, um, out of the hobby shops at the prison. But it was interesting to go see what the clinic was like there, what was possible and not possible and in, within the prison. Uh, the, the extremely kind of absurd, squishy gore effects here are by Screaming Mad George. Screaming Mad George is someone that I've just worked with on tons of movies. I always try to include him whenever I have something very interesting. He's, uh, he's actually from, um, from Kyoto, I think, but has, has um, lived in the U.S. forever. He's based out of L.A. Um, and he's a, he's a real champ. He's come to Spain now a couple times to work to work with us here. And this is the scene that I, I assumed I would start um, losing the female audience on, just for the, for the humiliation involved. Of course, you're, we're always, I'm always trying, we're always trying to figure out exactly how can we make the bad guy bad enough. And so to make them bad, you really have to have them do kind of perverse, horrible things. And so this kind of, this sort of domination scene by him, um, making her a dog, um, is very uncomfortable and um, very humiliating. And it's, uh, it's humiliating to women. And, uh, and of, of course, this made him a pretty bad guy. I think the only reason we get away with this finally is that the tables do get turned, and um, Elsa, Elsa has her, her day in the sun. Here, here we couldn't really afford to, to scan the whole scene to put the little spark into the um, nanoplasm canister, which is actually just a fuse. I tried to make, to make sure that West did all his experiments with stuff that he could, and designed it all with stuff that he could um, get out of a catalog. And prisoners, by the way, can order stuff out of catalogs. Uh, so he holds it up and he gets rid of it quite quick because there's, it just didn't make sense. The whole, this whole scene is one shot and we would have had to scan the whole thing just to put a spark inside that inside that, um, that little bulb. Um, what also is kind of interesting to me, and I think a lot of people are generally, that are fans of Jeffrey Combs, um, it's interesting to them too, is that, is that in a lot of these scenes, Jeffrey reworks the dialogue. Um, he, he knows West better than anybody. And he is able to, he really understands what a scene needs to say and how how he needs to communicate he knows the way, he knows the character so well that he's able to able to to um, polish the dialogue so that it really i think it really improves it a lot Uh, Screaming Mad George also did the the Elsa Pataki uh, makeup. He he was responsible for for I, I think three major makeup areas. He was responsible for the makeup for um, for Moses Nico Baisha's character, um, who, as I said before, originally was supposed to be old, but then we just made him kind of this weirdo religious sick guy. Um, he also was responsible for the Elsa Pataki makeup and also the, the Simon Andreo makeup. Now for Simon Andreo's regular makeup, his hairpiece, his mustache, his, 
and that stuff, that was um, handled by the, the makeup and hair department. But of course, later on, we'll see that he has uh, much more extreme uh, makeup effects, and, and George was responsible for that. He, he built what he had to build back in LA and shipped it over to Spain and then um, executed it during the, during the shooting, during the time that um, we were in Barcelona and, and Valencia with this picture. Ponle esto. Un sedante. Es preferible que no se excita demasiado. I made a mistake here by making that so-called Thorazine yellow. Because it almost looks like he's holding another serum of reanimator, reanimation serum in his hand. I think uh, Elsa did a great job here. I'll tell you, I think people were really surprised to see this um, romantic comedy girl, cover girl, she's on the cover of, of all the big style magazines in Spain. And then to see her play such a great zombie, I thought she really, really did a great job. Eso no es una buena idea. And of course, there's some foamy drool in her mouth, which is what Stuart Gordon always called the the froth that that he put in the mouths of the of the reanimated in in the first movie. No podemos dejarla así. Llevémosla. Tried to um, give this movie consciously um, to give it a lot of the same um, story twists that the first one had. One of the things that it seemed to me that Reanimator, uh, that made Reanimator so entertaining was it just kept having these twists. Uh, I think when uh, Dean Halsey dies in the first one, you're, ju you're just not prepared for that. They, they, bring back, they, they bring somebody back to life, and then all of a sudden the girl's father's dead, and then he's a zombie. And um, when Dr. Hill gets his head cut off, and they bring back the head. So I think these kinds of twists, to me, uh, I think I felt like that's what the fans kind of expect from from Reanimator, and we tried to give that same those same kinds of twists. And of course, this is, you, as you can tell by the music, is overtly uh, comedic. Um, it's kind of interesting that when um, Nico puts that rat in his mouth, really what he's done is as is as. Um, Kika's head moves in front of him, he switches um, the real rat for a fake rat which doesn't have a head on it, so, it, um, so he can fit it in his mouth. It's an on-camera effect that I think is very, um, very um, effective. One of the, the, the in one way in which this um, movie is not like um, the, the first movie or even the second one, and really is is a very much unlike, I think most most uh, this type of genre movies, is that there's a lot more subplots here, and that was done purposefully. It was kind of you know there were so many different characters to introduce for this movie. It wasn't that there were so many introduced, but there was that we had to re we had to retell the reanimator story and then move forward, that I, I just thought it would be interesting to, to try something that I had never done before and I don't see very often in this type of movie, and that was to have uh, many different subplots and carry them all through to some sort of conclusion. Um, I, I think it worked pretty well and, and, and I find it real entertaining because I, I do like a lot of these characters. This is, this is certainly um, the, the, the Herbert West from the scene with Dr. Hill when Dr. Hill finds the serum in the basement lab, in this basement lab. Jamás podrás salir de aquí, ¿me oyes? And this is very similar to when Jeffrey gets the shovel in the first movie to to whack um, David Gale over the head. No! And what prison movie would be a prison movie if there wasn't a riot? 
think we, I think this is obligatory. I think this is one of um, Jeffrey Combs's um, best scenes just because it's so difficult. There's so much for him to do here, and he's got to explain so much stuff as he does it. Eso lo electrocutará. De eso se trata. Únicamente con la electrocución conduciremos el nanoplasmo hasta el hipotálamo, de donde podremos extraerlo en el momento de la muerte. Un momento. ¿Quiere inyectar su nanoplasmo a Laura? Entre roedores no había problema y entre seres humanos sí. Él está a punto de morir. ¿Quieres que Laura se quede así? In the movie we've, um... We've pretty much um, gone into beyond reanimator. We're now into the we're into the nanoplasm story now. And this is of course Screaming Mad George effects on the on the forehead of Simon Andreu. No se muere. No se muere. The um the design of the collector for the nanoplasm is purposefully very crude and and sort of pasted together with with, um, with once of things that Wes can order through a catalog. I think that the um, the Filmax um, production crew, Filmax of course being the company that um, produces the Fantastic Factory. Um, it really does a great job of giving us uh, a lot of bang for the buck. Uh, they, that we really, I think, get, get a lot of um, production value for, for our budget in, in what's basically a, a, you know, kind of a, a small horror movie. Um, the, the Fantastic Factory was a, um, is a line of film that, um, that I came to Spain to to um, to, dis to kind of create for um, for Julio Fernandez, who is the uh, who's the owner of Filmax. Uh, Filmax is an, is a distributor in Spain, and they wanted to go into making movies for export. So I came to sort of to make this these types of um, genre movies there. Um, the the I think the the head of the physical production there, Teresa Hefael. Um, really does a great job of of getting us a crew together that can that can not only build all these sets but but take us to other cities to shoot and and get um, certainly way more extras than we probably would have been able to afford in in L.A. and um, even to the extent that in in Spain, for example, you don't have Western costume, you don't have these big costume houses, so all those. All those guards' uniforms are are basically um, um, constructed for us. All the the wardrobe is normally built. The, the, it's a it's a little different way of making movies than we have in LA. Of course, this is I think one of the the really interesting effects of the movie because it's a combination of physical, digital, and if what's her arm flew over her head, we cut from her real face to a fake rubber head that Screaming Mad George made anim with animatronics um, beneath it by, um, by George's animatronics guy, Greg Ramundos. Um, it's a mixture of um, digital and mechanical, and I think it gives you a very uncomfortable feeling. You don't really quite know what you're looking at. And, uh, and I think that for me, that's what that's generally my approach to effects. I always think that you need to mix things up. You wanna, I always like to change the, 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 um, the gag from shot to shot. And I try, of course we don't, uh, we 
don't have the the type of budget necessary to do real 3 3D digital animation. But um, even if we did, I don't think I'd use it because I think that a lot of times um, it, it does have an, an animated effect, however well uh, it's it's realized, um, you know, physically on screen. And I, of course, I'm also kind of a little bit of a sucker for all the puppet puppet type of gags from the 80s and the, and the makeup and rubber effects. Um, if in Reanimator, I think that's part of the style and the and the charm of the movie. Uh, I think this is not, I think you don't, if, a, if an effect is a little bit clunky in Reanimator, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it necessarily um, works against the, um, the really the story and, and the style of the movie. It is it, it, what happens in this movie is pretty is pretty absurd. This um, the bald guy there is actually Cesar Navaruda, who is our our rat wrangler. He's the and he handles he handles all manner of, of animals for us on the Fantastic Factory movies. Sound in this movie, I think, is very good as well. The the mix, was, the the mix was um, was uh, done by uh, Mark Ortz, who's also done all of the Fantastic Factory movies at a at um, soundtracks in Barcelona, and I think he's a very creative mixer. And I think he really um, he really uh, makes things work when they have no no business working. Lab setup here is always an issue with uh, the these types, at least the, the Reanimator movies. In the second one, it was Jeffrey's father-in-law that came to our set, and he was a chemist, and he saw how we had hooked up all the tubes, and he said, "Man, this is ridiculous. This won't work at all." And so he actually sat down and and put it all together in a reasonable way. Uh, in this case, we did have a doctor look at it, but you know, since none of us really has any idea what all those little, all those tubes are, are for, we just get, we get somebody to tell us it's, it's all right, and we do it. It just, it has to look like a giant chemistry set. Although all the sound work was done in, in Barcelona, all the foley and all the um, sound effects. Um, we did the the um, the dubbing, the ADR um, for the American actors um, in LA, and um, on some of the Spanish actors, we actually had to revoice them because their actor their accents were too strong, and sometimes we had to fix fix dialogue. Um, for actors and and find voice actors who could imitate it and just fix some fix the uh, some of the um, the accents uh, that was uh, I thought really a, a good job and of course the fo the um, the walla for the movie was also done in LA it was um, coordinated by by Jack Murphy who, who um, was who was the producer of the DVD, the special DVD edition of the original Reanimator, which I, I think is really excellent, and he was able to find some, some uh, you know some actors that could actually seamlessly get in and out of, of some of these characters' mouths and and uh, adjust a few things. This was kind of an attempt to to give a look to a, a reanimated um, subject's um, vision and then show the change of look when he is um, given the NPE or the nanoplasm. Um, 
eh, finally, I don't know that it makes a whole lot of sense, but it, um, but it does look pretty cool. So, so we um, we kept it. It's a mix of course, a mixture, of course, of um, of of a very wide-angle lens photography and um, then some um, uh, digital enhancement. This is supposed to be when he's um, he's got the NPE now. I, you know, why he would see it blue instead of normal, I have no idea, but, um, but it looked pretty cool. And actually, I think it was um, Bernat, our editor, who, um, who kind of worked out um, this kind of look. Of course, we, we shot it with the wide-angle lens, but he's the one that worked out the pacing of the double images, the slowing down, the freeze frame, all the, all the little trickeries involved in it were, were, was of his design. As I said, I, th I think he did a great job with the, with the cutting. But I also have to, to mention that um, we had the, the assistance of, uh, of an Amer uh, British editor, Andy Horvich, that's worked on, on, a lot of, um, a lot of movies. He's, he's helped me on some, and he's actually been the editor for Stuart Gordon on some of his movies. And he just he came by Barcelona to visit, and I. I asked him if he'd look at the look at the film. We had had it all cut together, and give us his input. And he sat and watched it, and then um, and then stayed around a few days and and worked with Bernat a little to to work out, especially some of the structuring of the story, which is some of the some of the intercutting of the of the basic storylines. Part of the idea of having the, this look for the for the um, NPE subject was that you would know it was the we would know that it was the um, wardens um, that the, that it was the warden entering there from the very beginning. And of course, now we get to see a little more Screaming Mad George makeup as the warden starts. Um, um, expressing a little of the nanoplasm of the rat that's inside him. I think one of the, one of the things that really makes this scene work is um, Santiago Segura's reactions to the absurd situation. I think he really um, kind of makes it a whole lot more fun. The, um, got to mention this prison. My God, this the entrance way um, had five um, cell blocks off of it. I mean, you couldn't have if you were going to build a prison, if you're going to design one, you'd think it was that it was just too theatrical to think that from one center place you could see all the um, all the cell blocks. And the interesting thing was is when we came into the place where Santiago Segura is was actually an altar. And they used to have masses there, and, it, and they had a big cross and, and religious things. And so you can imagine that they would bring out the, the, um, all the prisoners that have to go stand out in the, on the, um, outside their cells, and they would all be looking at this, um, at this priest um, giving him Sunday Mass. I was told that this was a prison that was built during the Franco era for political prisoners, um, well, when, in the time when um, Spain was... Um, was a um, fascist dictatorship um, before 1980. Laura! Laura! And this is, of course, more, um, more Scream Mad George Greg Ramundo's um, effects here. gory scene in which we see um, the effects of having the wrong nanoplasm in you. Of course you could have never done this in, in Reanimator 1 or 2. It's, um, it wouldn't really fit the, the concept which was in the first two it was basically body parts. 
and this goes way beyond what H.P. Lovecraft ever intended for Reanimator. Estos hombres te han causado problemas. Yo no, yo no he hecho eso. Bueno, tal vez he sido yo. O puede que se hayan suicidado. The uh, the the vast majority of um, this movie was. Um, was worked out in storyboards in advance. Of course, they they get changed on set, but they provide a a basic um, a basic plan for for how to tell the story. Um, in this case, of course, we're trying to tell how why um, what exactly is the bad guy going to do now that he's a really bad guy. I like the idea that that he starts losing his edge a little bit. That he's that he's getting a bit schizophrenic. He's a bit concerned about his, um, a, you know, his rattiness takes over. Um, but we get to see um, what he would do with, um, with this serum, which is eternal suffering with, uh, for execution. But, the, but in working out the, what kind of shots we needed, um, um, we've been, I've, used quite um, in a lot of these movies the, the storyboard uh, um, artistry of um, D.H. Covey um, who's someone who really uh, doesn't he does kind of a little more than storyboards he's not just boarding what we tell him a lot of times what he's doing is is really coming up with um, with ways to um, to to tell the to design the scenes and I think that he, he really has a great sense of, of genre story. He's a big horror fan and, is, um, and really contributes a lot. Here Santiago Segura, of course, is, is really, um, has a scene all to himself. And I, I really think that he really shines when he, when he can take off. And I wish that we could have used a lot more of this footage. He goes on and on. He's just the, he's just the greatest guy on set. He's so, He's so well known, he's such a big character, and he's made so much money in, in the movies. He's one of the few actors in Spain that really is box office. And he, um, it, but he's someone who just treats everybody on the crew the same and is, gives 120% every time. I, I, I was not real thrilled with this location. It was kind of imposed upon me by the DP and, the, um, and Fernando Izquierdo, the first AD. But after it was done, I, I really thought it was great. It's some of the coolest photography. And I really, it's kind of like a real classic scene of the, of the um, you know, the girl in the dark. And I, I particularly really, really think it's a great scene. And of course, it has the obligatory nudity. And, and um, it really plays off of, of Moses very well as we carry his story further. This, um, this religious freak that, that is, varies between being a cannibal and, and seeking forgiveness. And there, of course, you see Trina and George's um, um, you know, gore makeup on his face. But um, I thought it was a lot of fun to just to see a big breast in the foreground with a zombie next to it. And Nico does a great job with it. Screaming at George had actually built a um, stretchy breast for Nico to pull back on and bite off, kind of a la Dawn of the Dead. Um, and we actually just didn't have time to shoot it. It was, um, we were running and gunning in this movie. But um, I think the scene worked quite well, just as it is. Once she screams, you get the point. Laura! And this is classic algo. West moment. And the fans of Reanimator once again will um, will certainly see the reference in the um, in the deadpan look that West gives um, towards the end of this scene. Pero quizá podamos salvar a tu amiga. Laura. Se llama Laura. Y es la casa de la muerte. ¿Qué? La has buscado en esa zona. Si la ha encontrado el alcaide, la habrá llevado allí. ¿El alcaide? Pero si está muerto. ¡Que Dios le maldiga! So, 
That's the, certainly a reference to when Dan Kane says, but he's about Dr. Hill, but he's dead. And Wes says, um, not anymore. Well, we figured that, you know, we didn't have to say not anymore. That would be overdoing it. But certainly the, the beat is the same. And we have lots of this throughout the movie for the, for the fans, of which I'm one. And of course, Moses is always, um, always um, playing the same bit over and over again, and we expect it, and, and I think it makes it a lot of fun. I really, this was something when they put, when we shot this scene, man, the sounds were so loud, and I was on the monitor looking at, I was really afraid this guy was hurt. It was so brutal. And it might have just had to do with the sound of it. But man, they, they had, you know, sometimes you worry when they put all those charges on these actors and you just think, my God, you know, this is dangerous. But um, I guess that's, you know, it's done every day in the movies. It just, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the sound on set. And Nico had a great time doing it. He loved it. Fue genial lo que hiciste allí. Me gustas. Me gustas muchísimo. I wondered how far to go in this set towards the end of how smoky or kind of dark to make it. And I, I took the advice of the first AD and, and kept it a bit clearer than my, my natural tendency would be. But I think it, it's better that way. And here, this is actually my voice with hers. I did the, um, in the English version, I actually did the, um, the bad voice mixed with Elsa's voice. My contribution to the, um, to the acting of the movie. I love seeing all these guys kind of twitching in the background in their eternal death throes. I, I don't know why, but I just find it really funny. And here, Simon Andrea does such a great job of getting a blowjob. I think he just, he's just absurd. And this is what everybody wanted to see ever since um, he humiliated Elsa by, by, uh, by making her act like a dog. In the scene before, when, it, when, he, when he, she throws the penis off and you see the rat running to it, that's actually just a pull toy rat. It's Laura. And this is a um, an RHK effect here. Um, Amador Rehak has um, did the Half Man, and which I I really think it's a great character, a very simple one, very simple effect, but. But I, I just think it's, um, it's just cool to see this guy um, um, walking around on his hands. And... We had a problem with the actual puppet, um, the, which is coming up right now. That's just a rubber puppet of the half man because it was so darn heavy when we first started to do it. <laughs> Jeffrey couldn't even, there's no way he could pick that thing up off the ground and, and throw it. I think the, the sound effects here are, are really great. Oriol Tarago is our, our sound designer, and he, I think he really came up with some nice um, punches in, uh, within the, the sound uh, mix of the movie. And Elsa, I think, is great here. She has that, this is a real horror look, scream queen type of, um, you know, schizophrenic evil bitch, sexy blonde type um, character. Tienes que sacarlo. No puedo. Por favor. Por favor. Dejas que me domine. Tienes que matarlo. And of course, the bad guy it's, has now been has has now been kind of um, um, diminished to the point that he's almost like a comedic character. Vas a matarme.
Why she has sort of a dominatrix outfit under her dress is um, anybody's guess. And, and this to me was an interesting part of the interesting um, narrative twist in the movie was the idea of taking the 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 girlfriend, the blonde victim, the one who had to be saved, and having her change places with the evil bad guy. So by this point, um, um, she's turning into the bad guy, and the evil warden has sort of become a risable character. And this, it's a lot of fun to see Jeffrey Combs and Santiago Segura in the same scene of a movie. I think that's um, that's really an excellent kind of um, situation. Ahora, a tomar por culo. Necesito intimidad. Yo que tú, no lo haría. <risa> por suerte, ahora mismo, cabrón, tú no eres yo. <risa> Now these effects um, coming up are um, from EFEX effects, which is also a Madrid company uh, run by Raúl. Romanillos. Um, Oscar Aparicio is actually the the main guy who um, took care of these effects. This is a mixture, of course, of, of rubber effects and some digital distortions. And, uh, and I think it was a it was obligatory to have a exploding um, body for a reanimator, which is a, a reference, of course, to Dr. Hill exploding from his overdose in the first movie. And Elsa is now in her full dominatrix um, persona now. It's interesting, <clears throat> She's, she wasn't an actor. This is, of course, George again doing the, taking the Ratman one step further. But um, Elsa Pataki, was a, an actress without a, a whole lot of movie experience and and really on all the on dealing with the character she she we really needed to talk a lot about what she um, you know how she was going to deal with it and there was a lot of discussion between me and her with her part but there was one point when we were rehearsing in which she didn't need any advice from me she didn't really need any direction and um, just did it very naturally. And that's when we were, when we were working out the scenes where she beat up um, um, the Howard Phillips character. And boy, the minute it came time for her to like kick his ass, boy, she did that naturally. And of course, she's a very physical um, girl that does martial arts and stuff, so she can kick about up to the ceiling. And uh, I, th I found that to be a very interesting part of her character. I think this is great, of course, that the whole thing works strictly because of Kike Arce's great, um, great physical moves on that. He, he sells the whole gag, which is a very simple gag. It, Amador gave him a prosthetic um, chest stump that sticks out of his, and he, of course he wore a, a green screen um, suit underneath it, and um, FilmTel um, um, erased it. So it, it's really an actor's piece. The, the mix here of, of West character and the madness of the of the action, um, and the, I think is all. It's it's kind of a. It's this is this in this whole ending sequence. I think you really see a mix of of Jose Manuel Gomez's insistence on carrying the characters through and um, a lot of the influence of D.H. Covey with the with the action of the of the fight and of course Jeffrey Combs um, um, keeping West um, consistent throughout the whole thing. I, I think that the uh, the intercutting here is um, really makes the, the scene come to life. It's funny when West says um, That's an, that you know. That's you know. That's all um, ese. It's funny. The Spaniards have no idea what ese means. Um, 
I think in America we have this uh, Mexican, um, you know, we have these sort of Mexican slang. In Spain, it's just like from another world. Um, of course, that wasn't El Sapataki doing the um, the um, backwards walking, and and, and yeah, but she is the one that's holding um, Howard Phillips's face up into her crotch, just like Howard's sister did in the um, in the prologue. Um, that was a uh, a acrobatic contortionist who um, who performed that feat. Elsa does a great job here of being a just a horror, just a, a real horror character with that sort of madness and, and evil and schizophrenia in, in, her, um, in her face and voice. Things got a bit messy trying to shoot this scene. You know, one of the problems I always have with blood in these movies is the blood we use, it always tends to like get real watery and I, it just doesn't see, it seems kind of, um, kind of thin to me. You know, this is uh, Mad George again and I've always been a fan of these sort of melting effects and of course the warden's um, penis also had to um, um, take the hit. Um, I tried to keep the story of the rat going throughout the movie. I, I sort of likened it to a Disney picture because I remember in things like um, um, Cinderella and stuff, there's always the story in these animations of the, the big people story and then you've got the little story of the mice or the little animals told um, inter, you know, simultaneously. So I thought, well, gosh, if it works for Disney, it should work for Reanimator. And I think it really... It, it really helped out a lot to keep that rat story and the rat penis story alive as a, as a counterpoint to the, um, to the rest of the movie. Although Beyond Reanimator, I think, veers off from the, the tone of the first movie in the sense that the humor is, is um, the humorous scenes are, are obviously placed in. There's humorous stories whereas in the original Reanimator, they sort of just came out of the pure, I think, delight that Stewart had making the movie. <clears throat> the, um, the story of Howard is never funny. And I tried to, I like real straight horror, but um, it, if you intercut it with the humor, it, I, I think it makes it more palatable for a wider audience. And the, you know, my intention was to try to, try to attract a, a more mainstream, or I don't know if mainstream, but certainly a, a bit of a wider audience. And, um, and by having the humor, besides the fact that it's a lot of fun to do, um, it, was, um, it was one way to keep it all kind of palatable to those that aren't as, as such hardcore horror fans as I am. There's a scene here where I, where I show up that I shot of myself um, and, and one of the crew members from the art department and um, we cut it out. Um, the, um, I even gave myself a nice big close-up. So great what you can do with digital now. We used to have to do shots like that with um, stiff plastic. The face of Elsa here was actually supposed to turn into um, Howard's sister and back, but um, in fact, I just forgot to shoot it. So it ends up being just her while he calls Emily, Laura Emily. And I love this scene because this is, this to me is like real horror. <laughs> First time, Wes doesn't die at the end of the movie. Of course, in the first one he died, but we pretended he didn't for the second one. In the second one, he's smothered. And this time I thought, well, you know, let him walk off into the sunset or, or moonlight, such as it is. And, and I don't know, it, it's kind of nice to, to let Jeffrey um, not have to do with death scene this time. Um, I 
wanted to put a little tag on the movie from the very beginning. The, the head of the company, um, um, Julio Fernandez, when we were knocking around ideas for the movie, he said, hey man, you could reanimate a penis. And so I said, okay, that's your scene. I thought, God, this is great. The, the, guy, the head of the company is wanting a reanimated penis. And so I immediately thought of doing this kind of a Ray Harryhausen fight between the penis and the, um, and the rat. Um, we couldn't, of course, afford any stop motion, but I think Amador does just a terrific job of a, of a penis um, rat fight here. And to me, it's one of the most delightful things about the whole movie. And of course, it's done as though it was the credits of a, of a Pixar animation or something. But um, I just, I, I just, you know, we just cracked up. I wish I could have used all the takes of it. Each one had kind of something different. But it sure, it, I think it's his tour de force on the, on the movie. And it, um, you know, gives the audience something to, to sort of react to as they, um, as they leave the theater, or at least, um, or you know, finish up with their popcorn at home. You can see by the credits that um, this certainly is a a Spanish production, and there was a lot of. I had a lot of concern going in. I, first of all, I was really concerned about whether you, of even doing another reanimator. After the 90s, when I couldn't even get any interest in, much interest in, in financing it, somehow when DVD came out and uh, it, there got to be this whole new interest, and before I knew it, it's like all of a sudden Reanimator was this classic movie that, that was, that was um, so, so perfect and it had this huge reputation and I thought, God, there's no way we can ever live up to that. And then on top of it, doing it um, with a, um, you know, with a, with a crew with a, with, in a country that isn't um, used to necessarily making these kinds of movies. I could imagine that if, I, if I'd made it in L.A., I probably could have crewed up the entire movie with fans of Reanimator. And here we were um, trying to introduce them to the whole concept and the, and the style of movie it was. So uh, I was um, really pleased um, that um, Jeffrey and I were, and of course the, all of our creative partners, especially the writers and Miguel and, and, and Jose Manuel and, and all of them, that we were actually able to, to get to the point where I watch this movie and I'm, I'm real entertained and I, I really think it's a, um, it's beyond reanimator.